we're going to talk a little bit about the other form of the join and then we will um, talk about inserts, updates, and deletes. Spending a lot of time on databases, um, that's simply because they're so important and not just even for this class. Uh, databases sort of form the foundation of an application and if the database is solid then you can build a solid application on top of it. If the database isn't solid however then um, the application that you build on top of it is going to also be very fragile. So we want to make sure we get this right. So it's important not just for this class but for really anything that you do in IT. Um, and it's not enough just to go over something one time. I mean, you, I think all or most of you have had CISS 143, but it's one of those things that if you're not doing it regularly, you're, you're la uh, apt to forget it. Whereas if we practice it, um, then, you know, hopefully it sticks and you'll get better at it. So, first thing I want to do is I want to show an alternate syntax for a join. All right, in this example, we have two tables, an order table and a customer table. There's a one-to-many between the order and customer table. One order can only have one customer, whereas one customer can have many orders. Because of that, all right, the foreign key is on the one side of the one-to-many relationship, right? So an order can only have one customer. In other words, we can have a customer ID in the order table because there's only going to be one customer per order. So we can put a customer in a customer ID field and that'll work out fine. So on the one side of the one-to-many relationship, you have a key that points to the many side when you implement a one-to-many relationship. If you think about it, the reverse uh, wouldn't make sense. If we had a order ID in the customer table, that would mean that the customer could only have one order, and that's clearly not the case. All right? Could you imagine an organization? Hey, we'd like to place an order. I'm sorry, but you've ordered from us before. You can't order again wouldn't be a very good way to do business. So in this case, as you see, the order can point to the customer because there's only one customer that is relevant. So here's the syntax for that. And this is an inner join. An inner join means that there has to be something in each of the two tables. All right? So... If it was possible to have an order with no customer, it would not show up when we did the inner join. All right? If it was possible in the database to have a order that had no valid customer in it, it would not show up. So we have the select that works the same. From orders, that's sort of the initiating table, and then we have the phrase inner join customers, the table that we're joining with, on, and then we have the criteria that matches them up. This would be the equivalent of this.
this would be the equivalent of from orders comma customers where order customer ID equals customer's customer ID. All right. Equivalent. Same thing. All right. Why would you use one versus the other? From what I understand, there could be some performance issues if you use the inner join. It could, it could actually work faster than if you use a where clause like this. So that's one motivation. I don't know that for a fact. I have heard, and it might depend on the situation. The other reason is that this syntax allows you to do outer joins, whereas with the where clause, near as I know, there's no way to do an outer join. And what's an outer join? It's where you have things where they might not match up. All right? In this case, they have, they show an inner join. They have to match up. A left join. You're going to get everything from table one, and you're going to get table twos where they match up. A right join. You're going to get everything from table two, and you're going to get the stuff from table one where they match up. And finally, a full outer join would be everything. Insert the missing part in the join clause to join the two tables using customer ID. Yeah, that doesn't look like much fun. It's more Pardon me? That's more like a practice exercise. Right, exactly. All right, we showed the inner join. To join three tables, you have your starting table, inner join, inner join. So you sort of nest them like this. So you have your first table. That's inner join with customers. Then all of that, you inner join with shippers. In the case of there being multiple tables. A left join would look like this. In this example, we want to see all the customers, and for customers that have an order, we want to see their matching orders. Okay? If we did an inner join on this, we would only see customers that had orders. In fact, let's. Let's see what happens when we try it ourselves. If I said inner join here, we see the customers that have orders. That's all we see. And if a customer has more than one order, we see that customer multiple times. If we change this to a left join, we're going to see all the customers. And for the customers that do have orders, we're going to see their matching orders. So notice this guy doesn't have any orders. So it shows order ID of null. This customer has an order, has an order, has an order. This customer does not have any orders. So you can see the benefit of this. When you use the where clause to do a join, you don't necessarily, uh, it, it, it's typically an inner join, uh, which means if you want an outer join, um, you'd have to do, um, you know, you have to use this syntax for that. Are there any questions?
and then right outer join would work the opposite direction. Uh, outer join would simply match up all the tables with each other. Uh, and if there was a match, it would show it, but if not, it would still show stuff from both tables, and so on. Now, this is just tacked on to the rest of the select statement. So anything we said about the other parts of the select statement will, uh, still applies, that this is just a join. This would just replace the portions of the where clause that contain a join. So, for example, I could still have a where clause in here. And I could say where order ID is greater than, what's a good order ID to do a greater than? One oh three oh oh. So again, anything that we did, we could do this way, and then we only get those orders. Or we could do this. Pardon me? And the group value of two buys. Two buys. And this shows that that guy has no orders, and so on down the line. Compare that to if we made this an inner join. We only see the customers that do have orders. Okay, questions about this, this part. We're now going to look at the statements that affect the contents of the table, if that makes any sense. So the, the table or the statements that, that allow us to insert, uh, update, and delete. Uh, interestingly enough, this has, this has uh, if we talk about being able to maintain the database and retrieve data from the database, they have kind of a yucky acronym for it, all right? And that's C-R-U-D, CRUD, all right? And if you see that, like, again, it's unfortunate. Well, maybe it's not unfortunate because it it's easy to remember. But that stands for Create, Retrieve, Update, and Delete. So if you read about something that has CRUD functionality, and we're going to be getting into this either next time or uh, the time after, we're, we're probably going to do a tutorial where uh, you'll, you'll generate an application with a database that has CRUD functionality. But at any rate, um, we're going we're gonna to work on the CUD part of it. All right? We've done the retrieval part of it with the select statements. And we spent a lot of time on those because, <coughs> honestly, the retrieve, the select, the queries, is really where there's the most variety and the most diversity. And remember that sort of makes sense because we want our query language to be very powerful because we want to be able to retrieve the data a whole bunch of different ways. All right? And therefore we want to be able to summarize the data. We want to be able to filter out data. We want to be able to join data from, from multiple tables and so on. So therefore, it's important that we do this. All right? Okay. So, the next thing that we're going to cover is insert updates and deletes. And we're going to start at the end. And we're going to start with the simplest but most dangerous statement. All right? And that is the delete statement. And the delete statement looks like this. Delete from table name. So let's delete from computer.
And then it probably will have a where clause after it. Where computer ID equals something. I'm going to put in just one, two, three, four, but it really it would be whatever the ID is of the computer that you wanted to delete. In fact, I'm going to start putting a question mark there, indicating that we're going to fill that in when we run the program. All right? You, you follow what I mean? In other words, we're going to plug in a value for that question mark. That's a parameter. So, we don't always want to delete computer 1, 2, 3, 4, right? We want to delete whatever computer we want to delete. So, we will know the name of the, or the ID of the computer, and we'll plug that in there, and that's what a delete statement looks like. All right. Simple enough, right? Now, what do I want to say? Totally lost my train of thought. Oh, okay. Why is it, here, here, here's, one of the, here's one of the things. I don't know if it's the thing I was thinking of, but what happens if we, del if we omit the where clause? Delete everything. It will delete everything, all right? Or it will try to delete everything. And we'll talk about trying to delete everything in a minute here, all right? So if we omit the WHERE clause, that's bad news, right? Remember, the WHERE clause is used to filter out. The default is everything, all right? So if we do a select from computer, select star from computer, what do we get? We get everything. If we do a delete star, uh, from computer, what are we trying to delete? We're going to delete everything, all right? So it's pretty important to have a WHERE clause in here. Typically, you will have a WHERE clause in here. And typically, that WHERE clause is going to include the primary key. Because typically, that's what we want to do. We want to delete a specific computer, one specific computer. And the way to guarantee that we delete one specific thing, and only one specific thing, is to use the primary key. Even if there's other keys, it's generally best to use a primary key. Well, I, I don't, I'm going to retract that a little bit. If you had a, another candidate key that there was a unique index on, it might work just as well to use that. But typically, I'm going to use the primary key if I have a choice in the matter. Now, we talked about referential integrity. What does referential integrity mean? Yes. Um, it means um, whenever you up update or delete something, it, it um, also <coughs> updates our tables. That's related to referential integrity. Uh, can someone add to that definition? Is data consistent across all tables? Okay. That's, that's a good statement. Data is consistent with all, all tables. Where would data integrity uh, a referential integrity come into play with this example? If the computer ID was used in another table? The computer ID was used in another table. So, let's make up some data here. I have computer one that was purchased in 2018. It's in room two, whatever room two is. And the price was $1,200. I have application one, which is Microsoft Office. And I have application two, which is Adobe. Sweet. 
And then I have in the application computer table that application one is on computer one and application two is on computer one. So I go and I try to delete computer one from here. What has to happen? <coughs> There's a couple options here. I'll tell you what can't happen, what shouldn't happen, what if, you, if it does happen, you have not designed your database correctly, All right, you have not implemented referential integrity, you have not implemented foreign keys. What should not be able to happen is this, that the computer be deleted and it leaves those two records sort of orphaned in the application computer table. That shouldn't happen, right? Because we've defined a foreign key. And what a foreign key means is that if there's a value for computer ID, it has to match up to something in the computer table with that computer ID. Well, if we're able to delete the computer from the computer table and we leave this, we violated referential integrity. We have, a, we have a, a row, or actually two rows, in the application computer that doesn't match up with any valid computer. All right? That's a problem. So that can't happen. All right? If it happens, we didn't design our database correctly. We've not implemented foreign keys. So what are the other possible scenarios that could happen? There's really two choices. It will leave the computer application uh, table alone, but delete the computer so it'll reference something. Right. That's what we can't have happen. All right. We can't delete it from the one and leave it in the other. There's really two options. If we can't delete it in one and leave it in the other, what are our two options? Delete both or leave both. That's our two options. If we can't delete the computer and leave the computer app records, we can delete both of them. That's valid, right? Conceptually, that's valid, all right? It does not violate in, uh, referential integrity. Or we can leave both of them. So delete both or leave both. That is a setting on the foreign key. When we define a foreign key, we specify whether deletes are cascaded or not. What do I mean by cascading deletes? I mean any table in which the primary key of the table we're deleting, if it's cascaded, it will delete the rows in that table as well. So if I define this foreign key to cascade delete, when it deleted this, it would also delete these. All right? And that's conceptually valid. We still have referential integrity. We don't have anything in any table that points to a non-existent row in another table. Or the other option is we leave them both. That is the restrict option. So when we define a foreign key, we define whether we're going to cascade or, or restrict. Cascade means delete everything related to it. Restrict means don't allow it to be deleted. Now, would cascading apply to the application table as well? No. No, why not? Because that has nothing to do with the computer ID, right? If we delete these rows from this table, we haven't violated the integrity here. So it only relates to when the primary key of what we're deleting is a foreign key elsewhere. All right? What would you do in this situation? 
Would you restrict or would you cascade the leads? Cascade. Why would you cascade? Right. So if we throw away a computer, then what? Then you throw away the application. Yeah, if we throw away the computer, we don't care what kind of software was on it. All right? We don't care what software was on it. All right? So, in this case, it probably would make sense to cascade the delete. All right? It, uh... Sometimes it's called the, these are dependent or independent entities. They define it. Like, the software is on a computer is dependent on that computer existing. That computer no longer exists. That software doesn't exist on the computer anymore. Right? If, you know, a space alien comes and uses his vaporizer gun to make this computer disappear, then the software is gone as well. Right? So... It's not important to us anymore. What software is on that deleted computer? So if we delete the computer, we don't need to know what software is on the deleted computer. What about this? Let's say we close a building. All right? The business building, they finally decide to retire it, right? And they're going to tear it down, they're going to close it, and they're going to open up the brand new Zeller's Institute for Computer Programming instead. All right? So we're going to delete the business building. That should be where, not from, by the way. Where building id equals 1. All right. Now let's think about the cascading aspect of it. I misspoke a little bit here before, by the way. This will correct what I said incorrectly. So, I delete from the building. Let's put some numbers up here. Building 1 is the business building. Room 1 is in building 1, and it's room 101. Room 2 is in building 1, and it's room 102. Now, I have some computers in here. Oh, I changed the wrong column. Try to delete building one. Okay? What does that mean about the room table? I have a choice, right? I can either cascade it or restrict deletion. Restricting deletion would mean that I cannot delete that room, I cannot delete that building if there are rooms in it. Cascade would mean if I delete the building, I'm going to delete the room too. Again, think of dependent and independent entities. If I delete the building, a, a big, what are those things? Wrecking ball. And tears down this building. All right? 
Does she take the rooms with it? Yeah, all right? A room's a dependent entity, right? You take out the building, you're taking out the rooms too. So the relationship between room or building and room should be cascade. <clears throat> However, let's say we delete this building, delete these rooms. What happens in the computer table? All of a sudden, we have some computers that are orphaned. We have a computer for that was in room one, one that's in room two, another one that's in room one, and another one that's in room two. So, we can't have that, right? We can't have a computer that points to a non-existent room. So, I kind of said before that you lo only look at the primary key of the table you're deleting from. That's true in some respects, but that also applies to cascades. So if I'm deleting a room, I have to look at anything that has a foreign key of room in it as well. I didn't have to do that before because I was deleting a computer and I would delete the applications associated with that computer. If there were any rows that had this as its foreign key, then I need to look at them. But application is not the primary key of that table, therefore it doesn't cascade to the application table. But if I delete the building, I'm deleting the rooms. If I'm deleting the rooms, that's the prime, that's a foreign key into this table, so it is relevant again. Now what would you think you would do in this instance? You delete a building, you would cascade to delete the rooms. That makes sense. Uh, what would you do with the computers? Ooh. Uh, and you have another idea. And you have better than a 50 50 chance. Okay. Yeah. Eventually. Okay. Maybe you could put a null value in depending on the database. But if your two choices are restrict and cascade, what are you going to do? You're going to restrict. All right. Let's, let's think of the, the, the more everyday way to say this. All right. If you're going to wreck a building, you're going to pull all the computers out first. Right. You're going to assume the computers are still good. Right. So if they were going to tear down this building, I would hope that someone would come and take all the stuff that's valuable from it and put it somewhere so that when they build the new building they could put it back in. All right? So in this case, it doesn't make sense. Another way to say that in more proper database terms is computer is an independent entity. The computer isn't tied to this room. We can take this computer out and put it in another room. Now, Strictly on the database level, we would, uh, we would uh, probably create the, the uh, foreign key to restrict deletion. All right? Now, to your point of assigning it to a different room, we could write an application to do that. All right? Especially if it's something we did often. We could write an application to transfer computers. And then... Once we got all the computers transferred out of that room, then we'd be able to delete the building, delete the rooms, and all the computers would be safe in their new location. Okay. Now, here's something to keep in mind. That when you execute these statements, these statements are called atomic, all right? Which sounds dangerous, right? What that means is that the statement is a unit. It's not broken down into parts. So if I issue a statement, it either succeeds or fails completely. So if I try to delete a building, 
It will try to delete the building, try to delete the room. If it cannot delete the room because there's something in the computer table, the whole deletion will fail. <coughs> All right? It's not like it's going to delete the rooms that don't have a computer. All right? Or anything like that. It's all or nothing. Either it's going to finish its task completely, delete the building, delete all the rooms, or it's going to fail and not delete anything. All right? Questions about that? So it's important when you define a foreign key to define whether it is update, uh, or I'm sorry, cascade or restrict. I have worked with some database engines that allow you to null out the field, if it's nullable, all right? Uh, and if that's the case, then that would be an option. Thinking in this case, though, I really wouldn't want a bunch of computers that I didn't know what room they were in if I was managing assets. So I would probably still make restrict the option, all right? Because I want to make sure that we're not, we're not demolishing this build, building until we know all the computers are out, all right? Question on this. What's another reason that a delete would, that's one reason a delete would fail, all right? And let me, I don't want to, well, yeah, I'll, I'll stick with that statement, that a deletion will fail. Two things could happen to a SQL statement. The statement could execute correctly and not do what you intended it to do, or the SQL statement could blow up because of a syntax error. We have to distinguish between those when we're talking about it. Because in this case, the syntax of the statement is correct. The statement is going to go and try to do that, but it might not succeed. All right? That's one case. That's what I mean by the SQL statement failing. SQL statement blowing up is if I said something like this. That is syntactically incorrect because building ID is not a string, it's a number. Therefore, this SQL statement would blow up. All right? So when I talk about a SQL statement failing, I mean not doing what you intended it to do. When I talk about a SQL statement blowing up, I mean that it gives you an error. Actually gives you an error. Yes? Another way to get a syntax error is like if you've spelled something incorrectly, like you missed a letter in the building ID or you misspelled one. Absolutely. There's, there's more ways than you can imagine to get a syntax error. All right? But I want to differentiate that from when I say, well, the SQL statement failed. That's not what I mean. I don't mean you had a syntax error. I mean, you tried to do something and it didn't do anything. That's kind of what I mean by failing. All right. Next statement we're going to look at, I think that's enough for this. Really, the only reason a delete's going to fail is uh, foreign keys or what if I have something like this? This statement will run, but it won't delete anything. Why? Because nothing matches the, the building ID. There is no building with an ID of 12131123. So you tried to delete something, but nothing was deleted because nothing matched the where clause. I don't know if I'd call that succeeding or failing, right? It, in one respect, it failed because obviously you wanted to delete something and nothing got deleted. But in another respect, it did what it was asked to do. It found any building that had an ID of 1, 2, or whatever, and it didn't find any. So it didn't delete anything. So 
uh, I'll leave it to you to, to, to decide if that's a failure or a success. All right? All right, next statement that we're going to look at is an update. An example of an update would, might look like this. A delete, by the way, only works with one table. All right? With the footnote in there that cascades could involve more than one table. But in the syntax of the delete uh, statement, we only mention one table. All right? Updates the same way. Update, and then we have the computer. Then we have the word set. Then we have a list of things that we want to change. So, for example, update computer set year purchased equals 2018. Room ID equals five, where computer ID equals one. So syntactically, that's what an update looks like. All right, there's no comma after the last thing. And the word set only appears before the first thing. Don't blame me. I didn't write this language. <clears throat> you just got to know that. So set. Update computer set. Then you have column equals value, column equals value, column equals value. Separated by commas till you get to the very last one. Then you're going to have a where clause. Okay? Then you're going to have a where clause. If I did not have a WHERE clause, what is going to happen? It's going to reset all the computers that are being purchased in 2018 and put them all in room 5. No, it's going to do it. The, well, you're right. It will attempt to. When could this SQL statement fail? What could make this SQL statement fail? Or for that matter, the SQL statement fail. What could make either of those two SQL statements fail? If you have the computer ID restricted for some reason? No, we're not changing the computer ID. We're just using it in the WHERE clause. The room ID? Okay, so how, okay, you're right. It could fail based on the room ID. If, if, um, if the computer ID is restricted, then you can't be updated. Okay. Mm, not really. Kind of, sort of. But I want a little more precise words here. What if there was no room 5? All right? If there was no room 5, then I would try to change that to room 5. That would create an anomaly, a problem, right? Because I can't violate the referential integrity. If I've defined a foreign key between room ID in the computer table and the room ID in the room table, that means I can't put something in the computer table that has an invalid room ID. So therefore, if there was no room 5, this would blow up. Oh, I'm sorry, you, this wouldn't blow up, it would fail. All right? Because syntactically it's correct, but it wouldn't do what we tried to do. It would not update the computer ID. Will not update that computer ID. So again, Referential integrity is checked by all of these statements. The insert, the update, and the delete. 
We can't have a situation. None of these statements will allow us to have a situation where we have something in one table that doesn't match up to something in the related table. In other words, we violated the referential integrity of the foreign keys. That's what's great about a relational database. If you build those restrictions in, if you build that integrity in, those constraints in to the database, there's no way you can force data that's going to break those constraints. You just can't do it. You won't be able to delete stuff if it causes a row to be orphaned. You won't be able to update something if it causes a value to not match the parent table. <coughs> Likewise, you will not be able to update or insert if it violates the referential integrity. Now, what happens if there was no computer ID 1? Well, it wouldn't blow up. It would say, yeah, I updated all the computers where the computer ID is 1. Of course, there weren't any, so I didn't do anything. Do you have to update every column in a database, in, in a table, when you do an update statement? Do I have to update every column? No. In fact, this update statement, I'm not updating one of the columns. Not updating the price. All right. That's still valid, the update statement, even though I'm not updating the box. <coughs> now, all the other constraints will be checked when I do this as well. So, for example, if I tried to set this to null, and this is a required field, it would blow up. All right? And of course, if I tried the wrong data, uh, this is really tough. I really have to stick to my own terminology that I defined. It would try to do it, but it's not syntactically incorrect, but it would violate the integrity of the database, and therefore it would fail. If I put a string in there, for example, it would actually blow up and say, hey, there's an error. You can't run that statement. OK. Trying to think if there's anything more to say with the update. It's going to make sure the foreign key relationships are still correct. Uh, you have to, you have to, uh, you have to honor all the other constraints defined on the database. Like if a column was required, or a column had a particular value, or whatever. So it enforces the integrity. Now. One thing, there's, there's some problems that come into play when you try to change the foreign key. Oh, I'm sorry, the primary key of the table. Because that also would have to cascade. If I tried to change the, the, the computer ID of this, I'd have to go and affect other tables. And there's a way to cascade it, to cascade the update as well as cascade the delete. Uh, or you can restrict it. I don't like changing primary keys. All right? I don't think it's a good idea to do that. Therefore, if it's an auto number primary key, you probably don't have to worry about ever changing it. Because it's a meaningless number anyhow. Who cares if this has an internal ID of one or a thousand? Doesn't matter. As long as it's unique, it's okay. All right? Trying to think if there's any questions or any other. The one thing I, I want to mention is this is like the delete statement in the sense that it makes sure that the referential integrity is honored. But because you're actually changing data, there's more constraints that come into play. Like if a field 
uh, can be null or not. If a field can be unique or not. All right. Remember we talked about a unique index. If, for example, there was a serial number field here that had to be unique, it was a candidate key, right? And we made it a unique index. Then, if we tried to change that serial number to some value that was already in the database, it would also blow up. All right? Or it would fail. Yeah, it would fail. Because syntactically it's correct, but it violates the constraints and therefore it would fail. Almost everything I said about this is going to apply to the insert statement. In the insert statement, you have to honor the foreign key constraints and you also have to honor all the other constraints, like if a column is a unique index, if a column is required or not, or whatever other restrictions you could build in the database. Yeah, that, that's going to actually cause it to blow up. If I try to put a string, that won't fail. It won't try it and fail. It will, it will blow up because that's, that's a syntax error. Now, the other thing, of course, with an insert is the primary key. Now, if you use surrogate keys, auto number keys, you actually do not set the primary key. So if I have an insert statement into the computer table, assuming that computer ID was a generated field, I simply would not include the primary key as one of the columns I was, I was inserting into. So again, if there was an auto number key for the computer, I would not include the computer ID as one of the fields that I inserted into. Everything else I said about the update applies here too. It's going to make sure that foreign key constraints are followed. It's going to make sure all the other constraints are followed. It's going to make sure that the primary key constraint is followed. But we don't really have to worry about that if we set up an auto number key, because that will be generated automatically for us. If a field is required, we have to include it. So if price is a required field, if we did not include price on the insert, the statement will fail. If, <coughs> let's say, we didn't have a computer ID as a primary key and the serial number as a primary key, then of course we would have to include it. And of course it would have to be unique. There are actually a few different ways to use, uh, there, there's, a, there's a few different styles of insert statements. But this is generally the one that you're going to use most of the time. Now, one thing that you'll notice in all these examples, I've been dealing with like a single row at a time. All right? I've been updating where the computer ID equals a value. I've been inserting a single row, and I've been deleting a single row. 
Do you have to do that? No. I could put a where clause uh, that included more. For example, I could, if I knew all the computers in a room had a value of $1,200, and I entered the values in wrong, and I wanted to correct all of them, I could do this. And that's valid. If, if I knew, hey, all the computers we bought for this room, yeah, it has a price of 1200 and someone entered in as 1100 Do we want to go in and change them individually? No, let me just write a quick SQL statement to do that. But SQL statements like this are, generally speaking, something that are not done on a regular basis. If you think about an application of bringing up a computer on the screen <laughs> and changing its data and updating it, or bringing up a computer on the screen and deleting it, or bringing up and inserting a new computer, you're typically dealing with one row at a time. So that's why all my examples have been oriented to that situation of doing one thing at a time. All right? Next time, I'm not sure what we're going to do. There's two possibilities, and I'll know by Thursday which one of them we're going to do. All right. Like to keep you in suspense. That way you don't know, never know what to expect. One of the possibilities, of course, is to have a quiz. No, I'm just kidding about that. That's not one of the possibilities. All right. That's all I had for today. I'll see you in lab. I do need to borrow someone's thumb drive. If someone has a thumb drive, I can use.